Dear friends, the period of Advent, like the period of Lent, is characterized by a preparation. In both seasons, we use purple as our liturgical color, symbolizing preparation and penance. A color also used during funerals, underscoring the penitentiary and transitory character of death as a passage from this life to the joy of eternal life and not an end to life. At Advent and Lent, therefore, we prepare for the celebration of the two defining moments of Christianity, Christmas and Easter. Halfway into these periods, we have specific Sundays dedicated to the theme of joy, the joy of the experience of God among men, which we prepare to celebrate and relieve at Christmas and at Easter. During Lent, that joyful Sunday is called Letare Sunday, which is the fourth of the six Sundays of Lent. And during Advent, it is called Gaudete Sunday, which is the third of the four Sundays of Advent. Both phrases, Letare and Gaudete, are synonymous Latin exhortations, meaning be joyful. This is what we celebrate today, being the third Sunday of Advent. Consequently, the readings in our liturgy emphasize the theme of joy. In the first reading from the prophet Isaiah chapter 35, joy is prophesied in unexpected places such as the dry desert and the wilderness and among unexpected persons such as the anxious of heart, the blind, the lame, and the dumb. The second reading from the letter of St. James chapter 5 exhorts us to be patient for our own time of rejoicing when the Lord will make his presence felt in our lives, knowing that that moment will surely come, no matter how much it may seem to delay. In the gospel reading from Matthew chapter 11, the disciples of John, sent to confirm the identity of Jesus, are told to go and share with their teacher the good news they have heard and seen among those who have encountered Jesus the good news of the blind receiving sight, the lame walking, the lepers being cleansed, the deaf hearing, and the dead being raised. Isaiah's prophecy of joy in the first reading employs several figures of speech. First, we have the use of synonyms, where the arid desert is also called the wilderness. The wilderness itself functions here as a metaphor for suffering people used synonymously also with expressions such as hands that are slack, tottering knees, and the anxious of heart. Another figure of speech used prominently is personification, a figure of speech which consists in the attribution of human behavior to something non-human, something inanimate. We hear the wilderness or arid days at being glad, rejoicing, exalting, shouting, and beholding the glory of the Lord and the splendor of God. Here, pity-arousing metaphors give way to metaphors of joy, which signal a change of fortune occasioned by the coming of the Lord among the people. The Lord is presented as the people's requital, their recompense, who comes to give them triumph, making the eyes of the blind to open, the ears of the deaf to hear, the lame to leap like the deer, and the tongue of the dumb to shout aloud. Today, too, there are many suffering people going through tough times of insecurity, health crises, collapse of economies, etc. And life for many feels much like a wilderness or an arid desert. Hence, have become slack. Knees are tottering and hearts are anxious. May the Lord's coming, which we prepare to celebrate at Christmas, 
inspire words and works of solidarity so that the joy of God coming among men may be experienced in concrete ways capable of rekindling hope, healing wounds, and restoring peace. Our second reading is from the letter of St. James. This letter written about 45 AD was addressed to the 12 tribes of Israel in the diaspora. That is, those Israelites living outside the Holy Land. You can read James chapter 1 verse 1. It was written during the Roman occupation and persecution. And we can feel that sentiment in the letter's tone. James admonished his recipients to stand firm in the face of trial, temptation, and test of the faith. You can read James chapter 1, 1 to 18. From chapter 5, 7 to 20, James gives instructions on how to endure suffering, rely on God, and work with one another. In our reading today, James chapter 5, 7 to 10, James asked his recipients to be patient in suffering and he draws a link between their suffering and the anticipation of the Lord's coming. The very first words of our reading in Greek are makrotumesate un adephoi. Adephoi here can be translated as brothers. But in a context and generally in Greek, the masculine plural can refer to both genders. Therefore, it can be translated as brothers and sisters here. Makrotumesate is the aorist imperative of the verb makrotumeo, which means to be patient or forbearing. It carries a sense of expectancy while waiting or an element of postponement to delay what is to come. In this case, James is telling his brothers and sisters to wait expectantly for the coming of the Lord. He then compares their patient expectation of the Lord to that of a farmer who, after planting, expects the rains and then waits patiently for the fruits at harvest time. They must not lose heart because the Lord's coming, the Lord's parousia, is approaching. James then tells his audience how they are to prepare for that coming. They must not make complaints against one another. The Greek word used here is stenazo, which means to sigh or groan or complain. They must avoid complaints and groaning against one another to avoid judgment when Jesus comes. He then concludes by reminding his audience to take the prophets who spoke in God's name and how they were treated as their example of suffering and patience. As it was when James wrote to the Christians suffering the oppressive rule of the Romans, it is the same with many of us today. We are going through different kinds of suffering, oppression, persecution in different ways. In suffering, we can still be joyful when we look forward with hope to the Lord. Therefore, we must exercise patience, knowing that our liberation is near at hand. The Gospel presents the interaction between John the Baptist and Jesus through John's disciples, just as John leapt for joy in Elizabeth's womb at hearing Mary's voice with Jesus in her womb. These interactions evoke an atmosphere of assurance and joy of the Messiah's presence. John, who challenged sin and evil and called people to repentance, preaching that the Messiah would bring judgment on the earth, was now imprisoned by Herod. He was aware of Jesus' preaching and healing activities, but still needed some reassurance or proof of Jesus' Messiahship, perhaps because Jesus had not yet brought judgment on sinners. Hence, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, that is the expected Messiah, or shall we look for another? Therefore, Jesus provided evidence of his actions as fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies of the coming kingdom. In Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5, and Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, he said, Go and tell John what you see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor hear the good news proclaimed to them. This evidence of his messianic activities should evoke joy in John, in his disciples, 
those present with Jesus and even the future readers of this passage. Even if the activities are not entirely in line with John's expectation of immediate judgment and condemnation of the sinners, Jesus says, Blessed is the one who takes no offense at me, meaning to accept Jesus, his patience and concern for sinners, and his way of bringing salvation and joy to the world. Jesus then declares John to be more than a prophet. He is a direct spokesman for God, calling the nations to repentance, but with the special privilege of announcing and identifying Jesus as the Christ. Jesus quotes Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 which says, This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. Jesus does not disparage John. He recognizes the moment as an occasion of revelation of his messiahship. Hence, John, the last Old Testament prophet and forerunner of Jesus, has the unique honor of being the greatest person born of a woman. Jesus adds, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John undoubtedly belongs to God's kingdom, but Jesus indicates that Earning a place in the heavenly kingdom, which is what he has come to give us, is more essential than the duties and significant responsibilities we perform on earth, even in the context of God's kingdom. Therefore, let us be glad and rejoice that Christ, who is the only way, the truth and the life, has provided us with the opportunity to enter God's kingdom. The Devar Adonai team thanks you for listening and may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. To follow our reflections for Sundays and solemnities, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page Devar Adonai or visit our website devaradonai.org.